you know, we will at Charleston Hope, our saying is like, we'll never overlook the importance of impacting one to impact many. Mm. Um, you know, if, if feeding one child, if making one kid smile, if, if helping one kid get on grade level, he may right. go and change the world. He may be the next right. president of the United the States. The compound yep. uh, effect and influence yep. that we get to have. Why does everyone have to comment that on my cracked sure. screen? I don't know. What's better, to have a dumb phone that's not cracked to, to the abyss or to have a smartphone that you can barely you like get shards of glass on your thumb <laughs> with? I don't know what's better. <laughs> no, probably not that. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear okay? Yes. You, you can hear? I think volume's good. So This is so cool. We'll do the quote-unquote formal introduction. Okay. Welcome to the show. I think this is episode 16 so wow. of Generation Giants podcast. And so Emily... Hoisington, you were my guest today. Yes. So normally I just try to introduce people, but I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a curveball. Why don't you just really quickly tell people why you're awesome, who you are, what you do, and the nonprofit Charleston Hope that uh, you started? Yeah. So I my name is Emily Hoisington. Thank I'm, you for that. Yes, you're welcome. I'm 23. I am from Goose Creek, so not far from here in Daniel Island. Goose Creek, South Carolina? Yes. Is yes. it okay if I call that Grease Creek? Are no, you offended? I am offended. Okay. Goose Creek only. <laughs> we don't have much there, so we take pride in the title. of. Absolutely. we got to take pride in something. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm from Goose Creek. I am the founder and executive director of a local grassroots nonprofit called Charleston Hope. And what we do is essentially work to empower the students and teachers by meeting the needs of our low-resourced Title I schools here in Charleston. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Yes. And, and, and again, we'll dig into that. Educational, what's your educational background? Uh, so I went to the College of Charleston. Um, I graduated with an early childhood education degree, and I graduated in May of 2016. Graduated in May yes. 2016. So fresh out of college. Yep. So like we, year. like we were just talking about, we're both trying to figure out the adulting yes. life. Yes. Paying that rent. Yep, paying that rent, those bills. The, f the phone bills. The phone bills, the insurance bills. The, the student loan traffic bills. Traffic ticket bills. Yeah, I had a big I got, one the other day. I got a lot of traffic. I, I continue to sometimes get traffic tickets. I, get, I would get parking tickets downtown. I, I should caveat that. Usually it's parking tickets. Yeah. Especially yeah. like on, on the beach where there's all these rules about... Yeah. Thou shalt not have the tires on, on the, the asphalt. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and yeah. uh, they're strict down here. Have gotten tickets about that. Don't lose your tickets either, because they'll just like go from fifty to yep. two fifty. Yeah. Um, fairly they're good quick at that down here. Yeah, they love that money. Yes, they do. Taking yep. it. And then one time too downtown, I thought that they didn't collect the the street meters on like Saturdays. Oh. <laughs> It's Sundays. I, but it's they, just Sundays they don't. Yeah. I was like, what kind of cop's going to be working on a Saturday, collecting street meters? Lo and oh, behold, yeah. I get a ticket. Yeah, they got those those ladies and gentlemen in their yellow vest walking around writing, tic, writing parking tickets all day on Saturday. I know. I need to befriend them. Yeah. That's what we need yeah. to do. We shouldn't get angry at them. <laughs> yep. We need to buy them a coffee, get yep. to know their name. So when they see our car, they'll just skip right over Right, and, and send them a picture <laughs> of our car. Yeah. Tell them to hang it in their car all yep. the time. So yeah. they know yeah. that's a friend. Yes. <laughs> that's not oh, a foe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we are good <laughs> citizens. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And so let's go ahead to Charleston Hope. Let's talk about right now. What, what are you guys planning? What are you guys doing? I don't know if any of it's secret, but what kind of big things do you guys even do? So last year we launched a program called a Classroom Mentor Program, and it's really becoming the heart and the, really the core vision of Charleston Hope. Like I said, we work to empower students and teachers, and we do that um, by providing relationships, resources, and opportunities um, really to meet the needs of the schools. A lot of our schools um, have really large gaps in the resources that they have, the academic support that they have, and just overall support. Uh, and so that's where we go in, Charleston Hope, really asking the question of, what are your needs? And within the realm of who we are, how can we help you meet them? So we never want to be a nonprofit that goes in and says, 
here's what we're going to provide. We think we have all of the answers right. to fix your school. Right. No. Um, we at Trust and Hope, we are not that, and we don't ever plan to become that. Right. And so um, with our classroom mentorship program, we piloted it last year at the re- at the request of um, some teachers and the administration at yeah. one of our schools. So that was another situation where we were just asking, like, hey, what are the needs are? And they said, we have classroom sizes where not only are they are there are 26 to 28 students in a class, but, you know, our students are coming in from the situations and the backgrounds that they come from, not being fed, not having the right amount of mm. sleep, not having clean clothes to come in, shoes are too tight, just really lacking the basic needs that many other students have when they walk in the room ready to learn. Um, at our Title I schools, there are several, if it really a lot, that right. don't have that. So it's very hard for the teacher to focus, one, on meeting those students' needs and providing the academic instruction. And then when you have 28 students in a class, every single student is on a different level. Right. And the teacher, one teacher can't, cannot You're meet. trying to do this, this standardized education. Right. Right. When everyone has different backgrounds, different parents. I right. Mean, I mean, you know, I, yeah. think, I think it's pretty well understood that, it, you know, equal results and what you're given in life is, is, uh, is, is, is a myth. Yep. You know, everything's not equal. So yes. that, that's a challenge. Yes. And, and my mom, she's retired now, but she taught, you may know this, she taught school mm-hmm. for 37 years. Yeah. A long time. Yeah. I bet <laughs> she's, she's tired. She started when she was 12. <laughs> And, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shout out. And so, yeah, yeah, mi madre. And so, I definitely grew up kind of hearing and seeing a mm-hmm. lot in the schools. Um, yeah. Primarily elementary, which I think is yep. your is that considered yes. your target? Yep. Your elementary target, the schools. elementary. And and so, Title One schools. Maybe explain that yeah. for some of the students or even adults that are listening. So, a Title One school is really a school that has specific funding from the government because um, the the financial situations of the families that come in. Um, there's a lot of hardships there. So they, there's just, again, like I said, there's that gap in the resources that families are able to provide and then, you know, that the school is able to provide because it is a public school. And so they get right. a certain amount of funding. And then when you have parents that are just going through so much other stuff, you know, they can't bring in all of these resources. That's where that Title I funding comes in from the federal government. And actually this year, you know, we've had a lot of, federal government title one funding cut um okay which puts our students and our teachers in our title one schools even further behind um and just like i said you know getting those resources getting that support that they need and that's why because a lot of in our our, sorry in our schools the funding was cut and so you know that's why the classroom sizes are so high we can't afford to pay two more teachers um so 28 students come in one classroom um right and so so a title one it's con- a school is considered title one if 40 percent or more of the students are on free and reduced lunch and free and reduced lunch means that a family of four is living at or below the federal poverty line okay gotcha and that federal federal poverty line is around twenty three thousand dollars for a family of four gotcha um and in our schools that Charleston Hope partners with, it's not just 40%, but it's 95% or more of students living at or below the federal poverty line. Yeah, gotcha. So, yeah. Very cool. And so, and especially just, especially for our audience. So I met you, let's go back to how I even met you, because I think it's kind of funny. I yeah. met you, it was like your first week of college. Yes, yeah. Because we, so yep. <laughs> we met at the well. Yep, oh, I remember. At the well which was the college slash 20s ministry yeah. at Seacoast Church. Yeah. So, so for the longest, well, not the longest time, um, for years, I guess, mm-hmm. we kind of went to church together Yep. Um, and remained good friends, which is cool. Yeah. And yeah. I've gotten to help out at Charleston Hope. I got to do yeah. one or two, I can't remember now, of your Christmas wrapping yeah. big wrapping parties. Night. Yeah. And that's really where Charleston Hope got started. Yes. Right? The yep. basically giving students in Title I schools a Christmas gift. Yeah, it um, started um, really when I was a senior in high school. It started with my sister, so close to seven years ago now. She was a teacher in a Title I school, and you know she was telling me it was Christmas time, and um, a lot of her students weren't going to receive Christmas gifts that year. But even further past that, you know, going back to these 
basic needs not being met. You know, she was asking for pens and pencils in her stocking so that she could give to her students. And I, my mind was oh, just... Oh, yeah. In her, in her family stocking. Yes. She's like asking for gifts for her students. Yeah. That's really neat. Yeah. And is she still teaching, by the way? She is not. She's not still... No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She left a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, Title One's tough. There's a lot tough. of turnover from what I hear. An incredible amount. Um, in our schools, some of our schools, it's a 70% turnover rate every year. Yeah. Um, some, a lot of times in the middle of the year, we'll yeah. have teachers. It's that, just not a great situation all around. No, there's just not there's, support. And when you don't have support, um, you don't feel like you can keep going when the times get hard. You know, you just kind of get stuck and you stop and it all becomes so overwhelming. And then without that support, you don't really know where else to turn to. And so a lot of times in these situations, you just walk away. And yeah. I don't blame the teachers for it. I think that right that's something that we need to do and that's what charleston hope is aiming to do um is to empower those teachers just to keep going yeah so empowering others that's the ticket right there yep. yep yeah that's so tough and i hope and i think that some students even that'll that'll listen to this will have been students that went to a title one school yeah. which you know some of this may even ring some bells and maybe students in elementary school don't even know they probably don't know what a title one school yeah even is and what funding is and right. politics and right and like standardized testing and the politics behind even standardized testing and all this, there's yeah. so much to it. I don't even know where yeah. Common Core, if that's what it's called. I don't even yeah. know where that is, if yeah. that's been passed, if that's still yeah. moving along. We, we don't have it in South Carolina anymore. We don't have it, no. any, so we did it for like a year, I think, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. I kept hearing about how students were like having to learn math differently in like yeah. weird ways. It was just, this is just anecdotal. Yeah, um, yeah. Like doing multiplication in a weird way. Yeah. And, we have um, state, South Carolina um, created state standards that we follow now. Okay. Um, so we have standards. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. I think, yeah. I, I think that's a good thing yeah, at I, the very I least. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and, and we'll even get more into schools. Honestly, I think counties, because um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. school districts are a public kind of agency. Yeah. Um, they're kind of commissioned by city ca county councils, I think, yep. generally. And so I, I would even love for them to be able to create their own standardized tests. Yeah. I mean. Yep. I mean, because then, I, in my opinion, and it sounds like you agree, yeah. the more kind of competition, the more ownership you give to more people, the better it's going to be. But, yeah. you know, I was even researching yeah. about the Department of Education, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, from what I researched very quickly, I don't know if you know, it, uh, it like first started around the Civil War era. Mm. And then it became, but it was not a presidential cabinet from what I researched. So mm -hmm. I don't know how much uh, the executive branch actually directed what it did but it became kind of what it is now only about 40 years ago i yeah. think it was 1979 it was signed into law yeah. 1980 it started mm -hmm. so but we have we have now i think pretty much well not everybody but most of the people that are alive now i would say okay we'll say half i don't know that's not that long ago <laughs> there, there's yeah. there's elderly people but yeah. I'd, I'd say the majority of people that are alive now that's like all they know is like federal instituted education and, and maybe even before 1980, it was, it was also federally mandated yeah. education, but I'm sure it was a little bit looser than it is now. Yeah. You know, you, you can't even like get away with not going to school no. now, right? It's technically illegal. You can, yep. as it a sure parent, is. if you don't send your kid to school, as I understand it, they could you throw you in jail, jail go to yep. DSS, yep. which to me is wild. Yep. You know? I don't know. It's kind of wild to me. What do you think? I think that kids should be in school. Yeah. So I think that if, I don't see any reason as to why they wouldn't be in school. So what if, what if a parent thought they could get more value from shadowing them at work, let's say, than, uh, but where's, than going to like an English class? I mean, maybe, you know, the only case I could see that in is maybe high school, um, but not in the early ages. Um, mm -hmm. they, that's the foundational stages of learning. Yeah. You know, if kids are not being taught the foundations, um, they that's where they they fall behind in the later years of life. So I'm gonna sure. have to say I agree with yeah kids should be in school. No, and we can we if can they're not. No, we can respectfully disagree. <laughs> yeah, things. absolutely. We <laughs> we're still we're still great friends. Yep. But yeah, I mean, especially especially if a parent, because I know some people that have been homeschooled, and yeah. you get kind of double dipped. I think because yeah. you pay taxes as if your student went to school, right? And you could be sending them for free, right? And instead, you have to. Uh, I think there might be a tax or I don't know if there's a penalty mm -hmm. for homeschooling what that looks like or, or if you just have to purchase your yeah. own curriculum at yeah. your own expense yeah or go to a private school obviously you're paying a private school yeah. and you're technically 
So I think there's a lot of improvement, but yeah. uh, but we'll maybe get more into that. So Charleston Hope, where where'd the name really even come from? Cause it's a pretty strong name, right? Yeah, um, it actually just came when after I went to the college my freshman year and we kind of replicated what I had done my senior year of um, just providing kids gifts during the holiday season. We replicated from 40 students as a senior in high school to 900 my freshman year. And so what that entailed was every single student in two Title I schools received a wrapped Christmas gift. And then what was most important to us was um, the community members going in and meeting the students and getting to spend time with the students that they were providing gifts for. We didn't want to be a drop off and leave. Um, and so, you know, just as we were thinking, we didn't also then, um, as we were planning that, we didn't want to be just in the schools one time during the holiday season. That happens a lot. Um, right. And our students know that. And we saw that um, the first and second year, you know, kids were, all right, well, maybe we'll see you again next year. And it's kind of like, kind of hit me. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's kind of yeah, sad. Like, I don't want to just see you to come and give you something and then leave. I want to be able to invest in you. Right. Um, and so Charleston Hope, we were talking about the, I was just dreaming of the name when we were um, filing to be 501c3 and all that stuff mm -hmm. with the IRS. and which, which is the place in the federal tax code yes. that it falls under. Because yeah. I've been just learning about it. Well, I probably learned about it maybe in high school, college time frame. But, yeah. but there's a lot of people, you throw out these letters, numbers, and you don't even know where yeah. it's from. But right. it's the federal tax code, which... Yeah. Um, you know, basically states if you're if you're like a charity, religious, right. educational, something, blah blah blah, right. then you don't pay certain taxes essentially. But you also have to be structured right. Right. a certain way. No right. one owns it. Exactly. No one like business, which I'm right. learning. So for all those young listeners, like if you're a business, everyone owns somebody owns 100 percent of like 100 yeah. percent is owned by somebody or some people. Yeah. Like for this yeah. uh, podcast, it's a limited liability right. corporation. I own 100 percent. I'm the single member. Right. But um, yeah. But nonprofits are structured totally different. Different. Yep. So like I I founded Charleston Hope, but it's not a hundred percent mine. I don't make, I don't get to keep any of the assets that Charleston Hope. It's not even any received. percent yours, right? No, no. Yeah. It's a nonprofit. It's whoever takes over after or what happens. And then I do really like um, you know, if if the nonprofit was to um, what's the word? If the nonprofit was to leave and go in a different direction or they yeah. were to, you know, just kind of say, um, tie their hands of it, say, you know, this isn't like working. Dissolve? Yeah, Is that dissolve. Yeah, that's a great word, dissolve. Okay. Um, so, for example, Charleston Hope, you know, we would have to donate that money to another 501c3. Oh, so that's okay. kind of the point of being a nonprofit, that if we were to dissolve, no asset, no money in the bank would become Can go anyone's right. it goes back out into the community that's interesting yes because they're so, so that that also because churches are generally yep. 501c3 nonprofits so that's interesting because you probably see churches not yeah. us but people right people probably see churches fail at yeah. some point churches fail mm -hmm. yeah churches churches are the biggest example of nonprofits right. i think at yeah. least in america yeah um oh, yeah. nonprofit corporations so, yep. so that's really interesting like I'm sure I'm sure they do it in a professional and yeah. ethical manner, but you know I wonder where that all that goes. all that goes. You yeah. know, does it go to another church That's a great or where do, when they sell the building that maybe they bought, maybe they just leased or uh, you know rented? I don't know. Right. But that's a, that could be uh, a headache yeah. <laughs> in itself, yeah. dissolving a nonprofit. Yeah. Just as a quick anecdote, I, I was the chairman of a nonprofit, a local semi-local nonprofit, it was a sustainability mm -hmm. design nonprofit, U.S. Green Building Council. I don't know if any students would know about it, but being an engineer, I, I was involved in it for sustainable design. I was a local chairman. And while I was kind of ending my tenure as the chairman of the local branch, the main national nonprofit, um, which was autonomous to all these other affiliates, because we were all separate nonprofits, mm -hmm. they all wanted to kind of merge. Yeah. So we had to like, you know, not necessarily me, but we had to get lawyers to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, if we wanted to, because they couldn't force us if we wanted to, right. we would have to dissolve as a, as a South Carolina corporation, as a federal nonprofit, and have to like give all of our assets to you know the national branch and yeah. merge, and it, it was a headache. Yeah, <laughs> non oh, yeah. like I'm all sure. the all the red tape and everything, which there's goods and bads yeah. with it. Yeah, but um, that's know. that's definitely one thing I learned is when I stepped into full time, I was thinking of oh, I get to do programs and play with kids and provide the yeah. resources, and I knew it entailed uh, 
the business side, um, but not as much as it I ever thought. Um, right. That's the majority of my job as the executive director now, you know, is all all of that business, that yeah. business stuff. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, and you got your degree in, what do you call it? Ed- education. What do you call it? Ed- early childhood. Early childhood yeah. education. That was your degree yep. at the College of Charleston. And, and yeah. you, you were a very studious, gifted yeah. student because you were also a fellow of some sorts. Yeah. So Tell I, was me a, about it. I was a teaching fellow. Um, I got accepted my senior year of high school. And what that means is ba- essentially you get a really large scholarship um, to help pay for school. And mm-hmm. I also got a couple of other scholarships that for the same purpose like and, life that we have in south carolina probably uh, yeah, uh it's a little different because it's contingent on if you teach you keep it as a scholarship if you teach in a title one school mm-hmm. um so that's been a little bit of my struggle um i'm not teaching i'm not a teacher oh, but i oh. am working in the title one schools supporting teachers and yeah. improving math scores and so really working with actually right now to figure out some things um if that could possibly count if not all of those scholarships turn into student loans Uh, that's wild yes yeah (laughs) yeah because i was going to point out you really did the system well because you yeah (laughs) you got your degree and you know you had these dreams of having your own classroom Mm -hmm. probably and like pouring into students and uh and you're doing that you have your own classroom basically your headquarters is uh is at is at a school yes and um but you don't have to deal with like a classroom yeah. of students every day. You just yeah. have your own classroom and you get to pour in students like through your yeah. own means, through your own yep. vision yeah. and strategy and business plan and whatever yep. you want to do and all the above. And, and uh, yeah. so I was going to, I was going to commend you, Emily, you did well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll do even better if we can work to get these loans forgiven. Right. <laughs> yeah. That would be really great. Um, we I ended up getting, you know, um, really presenting to the board of teaching fellows. Um, they can't forgive it because it is a federal, um, it's from federal dollars. So they mm-hmm. technically can't forgive it. Um, but they did extend my grace year for two or three more years. So I have the next three years to continue doing what I'm doing and then see, you know, where Charleston Hope goes, you know, what the Lord has in store. And then if, you know, it is to start paying back my loans, at least I have a little bit longer time and I don't have to do that right right this second. Yeah. Um, so that's been a blessing. Yeah. So well, that's very cool. So yeah. I know, so there's going to be younger listeners and I think this generation really cares and wants to support good causes. Yeah. Um, even some of them probably would love to even start a nonprofit one oh, yeah. day. Um, you know, or maybe even you can do a good cause. It doesn't have to be a nonprofit. Like right. I said, this podcast actually is not going to go into it, but I was kind of torn between should this be a nonprofit and I have to figure out that structure, get a sec, you know, get yeah. like secretary, treasurer, or whatever right. is mandated, right? Or do I want to just start it as a business and, and roll with it, which is what I ended up doing. Yeah. But I'm sure there's many students that just want to know how, how does one even go about because I don't, I mean, I know more now, but yeah. how does one even go about starting a nonprofit? Because you started this when you were eight. 18 is that yep 18 is that correct you filed when you're 18 yes is that right you filed so you probably yes. thought about it yeah. when you were even 17 maybe even 16 yeah so what that look like when you were thinking about those early days of starting a nonprofit? how how'd you even go about doing it so i was actually talking about this yesterday with some of our team and we came up with the conclusion somebody um on our team she, or she's kind of like a consultant she is forming her own nonprofit. um longer story but yeah. So she was asking me about, you know, what you just asked me. And I was kind of like, oh, my gosh, that was five years ago. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. But we kind of came to the conclusion that oftentimes when you are young, people think that being naive is oftentimes, you know, a terrible thing. Uh-huh. But sometimes it's a good thing. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. if I probably would have known now if I probably would have known what I know now back then at 18 of all of the work, you know, that it entails, I probably would have got really scared. I still would have been passionate about it, but I would have been a lot more hesitant. Um, That's with so many things too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like any great thing. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of hard work, but um, I mean, it starts with a dream and it starts with a vision. And I mean, I just would encourage too with, you know, with our generation and our society, you know, that is becoming such a thing as to start nonprofits and, um, millennials have one of the I was reading somewhere the other day that have one of the greatest rates of giving to nonprofits than any Mm. other generation and 
So it's really interesting because I think you have to look at the balance of should I start my own nonprofit or is there a nonprofit in my community that right. I can rally behind that's right. already doing the work that I'm doing? Um, and so, but on the end of starting your nonprofit, if that's the direction that you go, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, you have to file with the IRS. You have to have about $1,000 just to apply. That doesn't even guarantee that you will become 501c3. And the other good thing about being 501c3 is when you get that status, if you were to donate to me, you could write it off on your taxes. So that's the appeal to being 501c3, that those that donate get a tax write-off. Right, personal donations, yes. which, which I believe this what I'm about to say is correct. If you're a business and you donate to, a, to another business or a nonprofit, I think it's treated the same as just a deduction. Yep. But personally, if, if you just if you just give to a business or give to a nonprofit, you can't. If you give to a business, it's gonna appear like you're supporting and buying something. So right. You don't write that off as a deduction. Right. To your income Correct. on your taxes. So that's. Yeah. I think we're on the same page. Yep. It, it's it's kind of like a basic thing, but I think it's such a misconception. Yeah. You know, so it, it so the nonprofit really just appeals if if you're gonna be getting a lot of donations from individuals, not right. necessarily businesses. Exactly. Which which is yeah is a valid like you want to get personal donations yeah. for sure exactly and um yeah so i mean knowing all that information you just i mean you apply you know the applications about 50 pages um just the application 50. yep and then Good you've got Lord. all these other things that you've got to type you've got narratives you've got budgets you've got expense reports already so um that's kind of talking about if you've already been you know maybe you start an outreach like i did my senior year of high school it grew my senior year we were getting all these donations kind of needed somewhere to put it we couldn't just put it you know people were writing checks for our outreach and like i can't put that in my bank account i don't know what to do with it you know so that was kind of one of the reasons right. too um we really jumped on because we needed we needed a bank account and with mm -hmm. that we needed to be able to give people a way to write it off on their taxes. And and so then once you do file, um, once you send that form, that application, that fee to the IRS. And, and with the application, did you file your, is, is it articles of incorporation yep. or is that prior? Yep, you do file ar articles of incorporation. That's yep. in conjunction with your yep. application. Yes, and then you, um, you can either submit it then or you can do it after um, bylaws. Yeah, and then you have to write your bylaws, yes. which is a nonprofit specific thing, as yes. I understand it, because I don't have any bylaws for. Right. <laughs> you, right. You have something else for for businesses, just on the way you manage your right. business and who owns how much percent. Yeah. But so the bylaws, yeah, that and I learned a little bit about bylaws too, because I was in college. Mm -hmm. I did several clubs. Yeah. Um, and I was the president of one or two clubs, and so even in college, the col the college required not that we were affiliated with a like the federal or IRS or anything right. in college, but I think it was more practice. They required us to have bylaws. Yeah. Just a way to govern. The way to govern you know, the nonprofit. Yep. Right. How long yeah. are your bylaws? How many pages? Um, so when we first started, you know, back being 18, it's funny that we're talking about this now because it was all brought up yesterday and actually this morning before I came here. Maybe I connected with your friend and had I know. some, some prep. <laughs> you must have. But what was your friend's name again? I'm not telling you. No, okay. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I, when I was 18 and filed for it, I really got them off the internet, you know, just yeah, okay. an example. Just and, like a template. Yep. yep. And then just kind of plugged it in with what we were doing. It, our original bylaws, um, are we talking about bylaws? Yeah, bylaws. Okay, yeah. Bylaws, I mean, they were like 12 pages. We have since, in the last two years, worked with a lawyer who donated his time to us. Oh, wow. And condensed them, and they're about four pages, just oh, very okay. specific. Nice. to the point um so definitely that's, that's almost surprising that yeah that he uh, he was able to trim it usually yeah they'll add jargon and uh, yeah. expand it yeah he was nice yeah very to the point because i'm like i don't have all this business background i just we work together but i was like i need to be able to explain it to people and if it's got all this jargon like that's gonna take me more time there's all these like whereas learn. comma blah blah yes, blah and, and all like, this stuff let's just let's just say <laughs> we will have a four governing board members and it can't <laughs> right. go above 12 like right which he did and it works and that's all that we need we don't need to yeah, have all that jargon that's just job security for these people i know <laughs> i know it is and i think because he was doing it for pro bono he was so great but i think yeah, you I'm know sure. he was 
he had other stuff to do, you know, oh, yeah. to make a living. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So your bylaws trimmed down. Yeah. Looking all good now. Yeah. Four pages. Good. Yeah. And so when you first started, how how difficult or easy was it to you had to get what, a secretary, treasurer, or what yeah. did you have to get? Um Yep. Uh, technically you just have to get a secretary, a treasurer, and then a president. And so I was the president and um, so we got a treasurer and a secretary. And yeah. they were all college students. Um, our right. co-founder, um, he lives in Spartanburg now, but he really helped me fill out that paperwork. And actually, um, the government lost, or I won't say the government, somehow uh, <laughs> it got lost, our yeah. original uh, you application. You said government did. Yeah, <laughs> the know. IRS, it's okay. Um, I blame all my problems they on the did. government. Yeah, I think most people do. But <laughs> yeah, that first application, we mailed it out in like December of 2012, maybe January of 2013. Well, we didn't hear back and we knew it, it could take, um, they tell you it could take up to two years um, for what? you to receive that status. Oh yeah, because I mean, it's probably even longer now because so there's so many people applying for Is there a way to get to the front of the line or how, what does that look like? Well, so when we found out it wasn't sent or wasn't received, um, <sighs> <laughs> they they allowed us to write like an um, a letter to expedite the application. Okay. And so we did that, and so I redid the application because being eighteen, I didn't make a copy of the right. original one. Yep. Make copies. Um, Ask yes, your parents. Always. Everyone should ask their parents for a printer scanner right now. Yes. No. Seriously. <laughs> I, I didn't even when I was in high school. I didn't have a personal scanner. I mean, pr I, no, printing me was either. pretty basic. You know, I obviously have a scanner now. I don't even know if I knew how to scan at eighteen. I know it's kind of intimidating. I won't lie. It's so intimidating. Yeah, I hate like, I hate doing it now. <laughs> and yet it's like two steps. You like yep. put the thing in the in press the thing, the and you press the button, and then yeah. it scans. And but that's if you don't, ha you know, when the application's fifty pages long, and you don't have the one where you can just stick it in, you've got to do page by page. So it takes like two hours to stand there and do fifty to sixty pages scanning, oh, printing. You, you didn't have the multi-page scanner. No. no. Even in college, I yeah. being an engineering student, I didn't. Maybe I got a scanner my senior year, but I remember I'd take pictures with my iPad yeah. and I'd try to get to where the light, <laughs> the shadow wasn't like looking too yeah. bad on it. And I yeah. remember I, I sent to like professional organizations. I don't think I sent my resume with, you know, like that. Yeah, I, um, that. Yeah, I don't think don't I applied for jobs like that, yeah. <laughs> but for like kind of not that big of a deal yeah. stuff, I definitely sent some, some yeah, things that way. It, yeah, it could work. But yeah, we it, sent that in and it took two years. So we really didn't get officially incorporated. You can act as a nonprofit once you send that application in for up for two years. Um, okay, you, okay, so you, once you send it, do you have to document you sent it? How, or you're just, supposed to, you're I supposed did to, not. Okay, right, right. right. Which is <laughs> did you email it or did you mail it? Mail it, you okay, have to you mail, mail it. Okay, you mail it, okay. I think, honestly, I think we mailed it to the wrong place and they probably just threw it away. Well, They get so much stuff, they're probably like, this is not correct. Well, sometimes it's so Trash. confusing because they'll have like a P.O. box yep. and then they'll have like a stationary where the building is. Yep. And then if you don't attention oh, yeah. it to, to the right person. Yep. It gets mixed up. And like, up how are you supposed to know who in the IRS you're supposed to send a document to? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But and the, the website can be so confusing. Um, so I spent a lot websites, of time. Yeah. They're, I thought they were always known for being really convenient and easy to use. Oh, They're yeah. Government websites. All the time. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. With the mobile friendly yeah. version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, I spent a lot of time on hold waiting to talk to someone from the IRS, right, just waiting. figuring out where the application was, how to get a new one in. And so we didn't officially become incorporated until about, I think it was August of 2014. Um, so I, the whole thing for us, you know, losing the application and filling out a whole new one and sending one took about a year and a half. Uh, but you were able to still somewhat operate. Yeah. How did that How did that look then giving your deductions to, to the people so at that point? Before you apply um, to be 501c3, you get an employer identification okay. number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep, so, so that you're able to give to people who donate and they can use that um, to write it off because it gotcha. shows in the system that, you know, you have applied. Right. And then... Yeah, so if EINs you, are for, so I guess corporations, and, and there's so much law to corporations, yeah. I'm not an expert. Me um, <laughs> but But whether you're a nonprofit or a business, generally you still file as a corporation. You file yeah. articles, of, uh, articles mm -hmm. of incorporation, yep. and you generally want to register with the federal government. So I have an EIN as well. Right, so, right. Um, yeah. But that's interesting. I don't think people can get deductions for me, though. No, I don't <laughs> think so, yeah. I'm pretty sure that'd be illegal. <laughs> yeah, but. I don't know if we can test the waters, but. 
Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't try it. <laughs> All right, fair enough, Emily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we came in corporate in 2014. Um, and then that, I mean, that just, once we got incorporated, um, we had, I mean, to be honest, being so young, doing it college full, I was in college full time. I had a full time job. Your whole four years in college, right? Whole four you years. were You were doing yep. the nonprofit on the side. Yes. Which, which I think is a good testament that, I mean, there's going to be yeah. people in oh, high yeah. school or in, in college and they want to do something really great, really neat, that really right. is driven from their heart. Right. And they're like, I don't know if I have time to do it. You well, do. you can make time yeah. if you care about it enough, right? Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing, too, is I think a lot of times we think, okay, if I'm going to start this something, that saying that we use all the time, go big or go home. Okay. Great things don't always, most of the time, start out this huge grand thing. They're built with a lot of passion and a lot of right. time put into it. And so, you know, if you are in college and you have something that you want to start or if you think that you don't have the time, you know, Find the time that you do have and invest into your passion with the time that you have. And then, you know, it's just going to keep growing and then you'll find more time. You'll get more passionate about it. And it's just, it'll keep growing, you know, that time that you put into it. But right. I think a lot of times we get so scared and we're like, oh my gosh, I don't have time to do this or to do that. But they do have time to go party on the on the random Tuesday night. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, be out at the beach for eight hours. We go lay out Kyle. at um, Marion Square. <laughs> I did hardly any <laughs> beach time at the Citadel was a whole another animal, yeah. but I definitely like running down to yeah. uh, Marion Square Beach. Yeah. Which <laughs> oh, yeah. is, uh, for those listening, is not a beach. It's just no. a big open field where With College of Charleston students like to lay out blankets. Yep. In their uh, bikinis. In their, yeah, I call it uh, sunbathing class. Yes. I, go to I was one of those girls day. my freshman year. I won't oh, lie. I, I don't hold it against you I every. Was, I was. I, you got to do it. It's like a rite of passage. We loved all those girls being down there. We loved oh, that I'm class. Sure you guys all did. the Citadel students <laughs> running around. I'm sure you guys did. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't wear sunglasses, yeah. though. So we had to, if we actually were like looking at Marion Square, we had to like totally look weird doing it. But, oh, my gosh. You know, at the beach, you can just wear sunglasses and whatever. So if you're but, a College of Charleston girl listening, don't. Do that oh we only looked See with what citadel men do we only looked with admiration <laughs> and respect yeah, all, yeah, res yeah. all respect <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> yeah the incentives of running though yeah, yeah. get get away from the citadel so <laughs> yeah hey but. well the college of charleston girls they love the citadel guys so i don't think some of them they mind there some, uh, yeah, there is an inter interesting um relationship there i think yeah so and for those that are listening college of charleston is about what 70 percent 80% girls. Yes. And the Citadel is about 90% guys, guys. And they yeah. both campuses are uh, two and about two miles away from each other. Yeah. So, so they intermingle. But hey, yeah. I was called Charleston girl. You can still intermingle respectfully. And all oh, that yeah. Stuff. It's not like. I don't like all that saying people's negative connotations about the Citadel. I think it's one of the best schools we have. And Amen. I did not pay you to say that. I know, did I you pay did you to not, say that? that? No, that is my personal <laughs> belief. Yeah, they're a huge. All right, we'll end the episode on yeah. that. <laughs> See you guys later. No, they're great supporters of Charleston Hope, and I've got a lot of really great yeah. friends that have come from the Citadel. And a lot of kids I grew up with go to the Citadel, and mm -hmm. you know, the, if one thing I see how great of a network the Citadel can provide you with, yeah. you know, if you go there, you know, the Citadel. I always hear, and I have seen firsthand, you know, if you went to the Citadel, and someone else went to the Citadel, you got each other's backs. Like you yeah. just, you got some kind of bond that. You know, you don't really have it other schools. Gives so. you a huge leg up to get a job, oh, especially yeah. in South Carolina. Yeah, it's a great um, school. But I think I think nationally, most people just like we know what VMI is, mm -hmm. and we know about the military academies because that's really what the Citadel more or less is. Just like VMI, right. except better in every way. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But just like we know what VMI is, I, I think nationally people probably know what the Citadel is. So yeah. Um, well, cool. Well, with that, we're gonna take a quick break. Okay. We're going to rest the ears and we're going to get back into awesome. uh, maybe some more college conversation, learn more awesome. of the big things you're doing, Charleston Hope. Cool. cool. Great. My name is Emily Hoisington and I'm the Executive Director of Charleston Hope. Today we are at our first Heart for the City initiative, which is where we have volunteers um, of all ages from across the low country come into our Title I schools and serve them in the areas that they need. Right now I'm at Sanders Cod Elementary and I'm about to show you all that we're doing here. Hey, 
my name is Chris Petrie. I'm here with Seacoast Church and Custom Students with Charleston Hope, and we're excited to be downtown in Sanders Clyde Elementary. And it's an amazing time for us to come out. Our students are here because they want to make a difference. So we are here in Sanders Clyde Elementary in the Communities and Schools office where we just stocked um, our first basic needs room. Our needs range from toothpaste to toothbrushes to combs to underwear, socks. We're doing uh, these parrot feet, so they'll start all the way from the entrance over here and they'll be able to walk all the way through. And the cool thing about this is that they have every one of their habits that they can almost like discover along the way. So as they're walking up through the parrot feet, see each habit. So as they're playing, it reminds them again what this school is all about. And so you are you are probably one of the greatest female leaders that, that I know, especially as my age, um, you know, roughly my age, because you're 23. Yes, 23. 23. And I imagine, are you just leading people younger than you or are they also older than you? We're serving people that are younger Not, than but, me. But, but our team, um, I would say about 50 percent of the team is older than me and 50 percent is younger than me. Right. So you're, you're putting this mix. kind of middle realm, but you're you're the yeah. not that I think it's a misconception that the the leader of the organization ha, the, has oh, to do right. everything. You you don't have to do everything. No. It's a challenge because right. you want to. Oh right. Um, but just because the final responsibility falls on you, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything. Right. But but describe just what is it like leading a team of, of eight. Yeah. You know, do, do, you, do you read any books or or where do you really yeah. pull your leadership inspiration from? Um, it's definitely tough. I think kind of what you just said really, I think, defines a leader, at least in, in my eyes. Um, you know, it's good leaders delegate, bottom line. They delegate. Um, if you, <laughs> if you, let's pause there. I, I love that. Good leaders delegate. So <laughs> they do. Yeah. With, with, with my fam, we joke because uh, <laughs> some of them are really great delegators. Yeah. So so we'll laugh. We'll they'll they'll ask us to do something and uh, we'll push back and they'll just say we're delegating. Yep. <laughs> delegating and the right way right um, sure yeah. I make fun but it's true right yeah and that's one thing that I have had to learn um, and it's not only delegating but especially in our world the nonprofit world you know it's delegating but along with that it's casting the vision um, mm -hmm. and the passion you know that's one thing I have really learned is you've got to find people that are passion passionate about the cause you know if right. they're not if they're looking to just do marketing you know, they'll do the marketing, but, you know, will they really do it with the passion and drive that you have and that you see yeah. for the organization? And so that's something that I really learned of being a leader is it's not just about, oh, she has a good resume. I'll take her or he has a good resume. I'll take him. You know, it, it's communication and seeing um, the person's passion and what and the vision that they would have right. for the organization. And so leading the team, you know, to be honest, I'm still really new at it. Um, yesterday we kind of had a t our first marketing meeting and like I said I was an education major so all of this marketing yeah. stuff and finance marketing business because a nonprofit is yeah. run like a business yes. you can't just yeah. you know, be willy nilly with your money right it, it definitely takes um, a leader that's willing to learn um, yeah that's good not willing to learn yep not being afraid to ask questions you know wait, I think a lot wait, of wait. you graduate wait you graduate from, from college and you're still you're still learning stuff oh yeah I thought you're supposed to learn everything in college no no <laughs> they lie to you <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah no um, and that's also the biggest thing I've learned of being full-time with Charleston Hope is is just bottom line again good leaders aren't afraid to ask questions um, mm -hmm. I think we have this oh I'm the leader 
I, I'm top. I've got people under me. I've got to know it all. You know, I'll straight up be like to my team, I don't know the answer and I don't know how to do this. Let's figure it out together. Yeah. And that's one thing I tell our team, especially for the position we're at of developing the structure of the organization, the intern that just started with us. I said, I told her straight up, I said, here's where we are. Here's where we're going. And you know, a lot of times people will expect you to be at a spot that you're not. And as a good leader, you've got to know where you are. Um, yeah. I've got to know where our organization is, is at, um, where we're going. But if I'm taking all this advice and all this information from other people, I've got to relate it to where I know our team and our mission and organization is at. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's big. Because there's so, there's so much information out there, too. And yeah. eventually you'll hear... A lot of it's good, but eventually yeah. you'll hear people that conflict with each other. Yep. And then you got to internalize. Someone may have said something that right. might be good, but may not be good right now. Exa yep. <laughs> which is a big thing. Yeah, that is key. Um, so, so key of, you know, you will get all, all, all of this advice, but you have got to be able to decipher what is best to take. One, I have learned, always listen. You know, just listen. It doesn't mean you have to yeah. walk away putting into practice all that people are telling you and telling you that you need to do. Right. I'm going to listen respectfully. And I'm going to say, okay. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm going to walk away doing it. Or just do it. <laughs> our You know, your organization or your team or whatever would be a mess because everyone has their own opinions about everything. Everyone has an opinion. About everything. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I think as a good leader, you've, you've got to delegate. You've got to be able to decipher what is best for you and your team and your organization as a whole. Yeah. And then, honestly, yeah. you, you got to run with it. Yeah. <laughs> you just run. With, yeah. Do something, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you move, do. move in the direction yeah. that that you feel somewhat comfortable with. Yeah. Um, and ask questions. Don't be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> to ask questions. And and I'm really big in Charleston Hope. The culture that we have tried to create is is being transparent. Um, mm -hmm. I think it could be very easy because all of us are so young and you know, Charleston Hope has been really successful. And so it could be really easy to be like, oh, we work for this nonprofit and it's raised close to $100,000 in six months or whatever, you know? And it could just be really easy to say that and then act like, oh, here's what we do. Y'all need to do it too. And it's like, no, 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 no we don't really know how we got here. We're just doing what we do. And like, we've got the passion for it. And right. Um, so part of that staying transparent is not acting like we have it all together. Um, I'll yeah. tell donors and right. tell you and everyone listening, you know, there are a lot of times where I will, like I just said, straight up tell our team, mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. I know I'm your leader, but right now we need to be a team yeah. and do it together. Yeah. Well, that's what the team's there for. Yeah, exactly. And, and you'll never know. And honestly, even when you think you know, yeah. you'll have to adjust as you go. Yep. Um, I think the key word is resilience. Uh, yeah. Even even in design and construction, in what I do in engineering, you, yeah. you'll design something, but something in the field will be different than yeah. what you thought, or something will change. You'll, yeah. you'll survey the property, and then they'll finally build it in like three years. Right. And stuff can we we just had it at work. I, I'm not gonna go in. I'm not gonna go into it. But a canal was uh, deeper than it was six months ago, and so it's oh, wow. uh creating an issue oh gosh um but but resilient you know a term that i've heard in a webinar was resilient design yeah being able to adapt on the go yep. and i think that's just what businesses have yeah. to do and, and team leaders yeah. <laughs> like especially because I, I lead small groups and you, yeah. you're in ministry a lot yeah. are you leading a small group do you are you in small group i'm in small doing? group right now okay yeah okay you've led plenty. taking a break from leading right a little bit <laughs> and and certainly you never know uh what everyone's going to come in with. Right. Um, you might have a plan of what you want to talk about and the lessons oh, right. you want to teach, but someone may say something in, in your small group meeting, you know, you're all trying to better, better each other. Yeah. Someone may say something, you had no idea. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, and then you just have to adjust, you know. All right, yeah. well, we we're going to talk about this, but this is where the conversation is going and let's learn from it. Let's yeah. build on it. And, and nonprofits are the same way. Tomorrow you could even yeah. get, I don't know, Twenty thousand dollars donated, or you could, yeah. or, or something terrible. Who knows? Um, right. But you'll have to adjust. Right. Absolutely. And uh, we have learned that, and and I have learned that, <laughs> just in life in general. And then, yeah. you know, Charles Snow. It hasn't been easy for years, and adapting 
to the hardships and adapting. Also, people, I don't think people realize you have to adapt to the victories as well. Huh, um, so what do you mean by that? That's interesting. Just the triumphs that, you know, that, you know, like you just said, for example, um, if Charleston Hope received $20,000, you know, that could, okay, so we just received. Right, what do you do with it? Kind right, of thing. we just received an $11,000 grant to start an after-school girls program. That's a victory, but now that shifts a little bit of the focus of Charleston Hope. It's going to take more of my time, so I've mm -hmm. got to adapt. The organization has got to adapt to that victory. A lot of times, you know, huh. we think we just got to adapt to the hardships and figure out, you know, we went through something really tough or something bad happened and, and we've got to figure out how to do it. But you've got to do that with the victories too. I think you've got to always be ready to adapt. You know, if you're just constantly staying the same, even through the victories, you might not grow. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. just kind of my take on well, it. Growing is change. Yep. Um, and a lot of people are very uncomfortable with change. Oh yeah. Uh, it's kind of a natural thing, I think. Oh yeah. You know, anytime, oh, yeah. anytime, anytime something is different than they expected, or, or something that changes midway, you know, people tend to either freak out, get uncomfortable, right. don't know what to do. Um, me, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would be lying if I said I don't get uncomfortable sometimes, but yeah. to me it's kind oh, of exciting. Um, yeah. Just because professionally in my engineering education, um, it's taught me to be a problem solver. That's yeah. what engineers are. And so whenever things change, it kind of just is an opportunity. Yeah. I think it's at least a good way to look at it. It's like an yeah. opportunity. All right, well, let's figure it out. Like you said, which is awesome. Yeah. Like, I think let's I would, figure it out together. Yeah, I think I would almost ask. And when I led a small group um, at Seacoast, this was one thing. My, I led an all-girls group. And one thing we talked a lot about was, you know, being uncomfortable is a good thing. You know, it means that you're outside of your realm. You're outside of yourself, of what you're yeah. used to. You know, you're being being uncomfortably, you're being exposed to something new that's going to just widen your perspective. It's just going to open your eyes. You know, that could be to love people a little bit differently, to serve a little bit differently, to act a little bit differently, you know, but being uncomfortable, that's really where space is created to grow. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really about kind of like what you just said, like, what do you do with being uncomfortable? Do you turn around and walk out and miss that new perspective, miss that new opportunity and growth? Or do you step right into it and see what happens yeah yeah so. i was even listening to a a podcast of sorts the other day and talking about, a little bit talking about being uncomfortable mm -hmm. it was talking about uh i think being uncomfortable almost gives you more energy too yeah because it was talking about how whenever you're tired you tend to want to sit on the couch but mm -hmm. whenever you sit on the couch when do you say that just gave me a lot of energy right usually say oh now i'm even more tired because i sat yeah. on the couch and got comfortable yeah it took away yeah. even the little bit of energy that you may have had and so, you know, whenever I get from home from work, I try to go directly to, to working out kind of thing. Yeah. You got to make time for it. Yeah. Because um, I know if I sit on the couch or whatever, or uh, <laughs> especially if I sit in the bed, I ain't moving. Yeah, same. Um, so same. I, th I think there's a parallel there with getting, getting uncomfortable. We think it will take away energy, but you can actually let it give you energy, I oh, think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it'll kind of that. rally you up and you'll have to figure it out. And especially if a team yeah. like you have that that makes it a lot more fun too. Yeah. If everyone's on the same page, yeah. which it sounds like you, I know you've got great people. Yes. Is yeah. uh, whenever, whenever y'all do have challenges or triumphs, how does that look with, with the team? Does everyone kind of high five, you know, what does that really look like? Yeah. So um, like I said, all this team stuff that's giving time and hours in the office with us, it's all new, but I can just tell you one of the cultures that, you know, Charleston Hope, one of our, culture codes that we've just created is that you know we will always appreciate before we celebrate mm. and so you know that is um and so one thing we're doing is just writing celebrations down on the whiteboard so that way no matter who comes in you know they're able to be seen the team's able to stay updated and we'll send out a weekly email with not only the victories and the celebrations but also the stuff that you know needs improved on and that you know right maybe we need to fix um we i send that out at the end of each week and um, but having that list of celebrations and making, like making the celebrations known, even if they're little, like, even if it's, um, like one, what was one, um, that we had this week that was small, like, obviously we had a new employee start this week and we had an $8,000 grant that we received that we found oh, that's out a good this week. week. Yeah. It was an that's incredible week. week, an incredible week. Um, but you know, going along with that, we'll also write on the board school started. That's a celebration. We got 
400 yeah. kids that got to come back to school that now we get to in invest in every single day. And, and for your stu for those students, it's probably even better for them to be at school. Yeah. Do you think yes. oh, absolutely. in a lot of cases, oh, yeah. a lot of them don't even really get food right. all the yep. time when they're at home. Yep. School is it's a yeah. big deal. Oh yeah, and it, I mean, it just provides, I mean, for any child in general, but especially for our students, you know, it provides that, that structure um, mm -hmm. that oftentimes they can lack at home. Like any student. Right. Um, <laughs> like any, even any, adult. Ch any child, right. Yeah, any adult. Yeah. <laughs> Adults are like overgrown children yeah. sometimes. I mean, I hear all the time. Oftentimes. Yeah, even from adults. Um, I can't wait for school to start back. We're going to be in a routine. We're going to yeah. be, and, and that's the same. Like, I think we strive for routine. We strive for that. Creatures of habit. Right. For sure. Exactly. Um, that helps too, because I mean, my coworker, a lot of my coworkers married, like, my, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing, kids. And so yeah. school starting back too, that's a big thing, because now. Yeah. You know, now their lives they have to take their little kids to school, which yeah. can be a good thing or can be a bad thing. It depends kind of just how their family is situated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but for, for some of my coworkers, uh, you know, they like having their routine, you know, now oh, yeah. they get to see their kids in the morning, every morning consistently and it's expected. Yeah. But yeah, and that's cool. yeah. And so, I mean, just going back to, you know, just celebrating the little things and just appreciating you know, appreciating how we got here, just always remembering our humble beginnings, you know, whether you just started this year with Charleston Hope or whether you started five years ago when we founded it, you know, remembering those humble beginnings of, you know, a few years ago or even last year, we never thought we would get here. You know, we never could imagine right. being here. Um, and we were just talking about that in the break of, you know, never getting complacent. I mean, just with those small victories, because without the small yeah. victories, you know, do you really have the big victories? Yeah. I don't know. Or you miss a lot. You got to celebrate everything. Exactly. You don't want to miss. I think if we get so focused on the big picture stuff, you know, life change happens in the small stuff most of the time. And so I don't, we don't want a Charleston Hope ever to lose that, that sense and that passion of appreciating, you know, not only where we came from, but appreciating the work that was put into it. It's not just, yeah, a lot of oh, people. we got an $8,000 grant. That was hours and hours of grant writing. It was out, and mm -hmm. without the grant writing, without all of the program and all of the people that have invested in Charleston Hope thus far to be able to write the grant for the programs that were built over the years. So, I mean, it just traces back to the beginnings of every celebration, every victory. Yeah. So. That's huge. Yeah, I yeah. think how you treat the little things and little victories, how you treat everything. Oh, yeah. Um, you yeah. know, especially in your daily habits which you probably have some great habits i'm sure you know to get to where you are yeah <laughs> Every, it's like everyone could everyone can probably uh you know eat a eat a little less donuts at work or whatever yeah or like you know do a little bit better in whatever area yep. i know for me we have bagels and donuts like all the time at work I'm like, yeah Ugh. i've got coffee a lot a lot of coffee all the time but definitely those those little things you know whether yep. whether you, you hit the snooze button or not you know on certain yeah. days something I sometimes struggle with. Usually I don't hit the snooze button because I got to get up anyway. I usually just ignore the alarm sometimes. Yeah, same. <laughs> I got I to gotta figure that out. And I have two alarms. Maybe oh I need to get a third. Maybe. Did you Do say you put why? it across from the bed so you got to get up? Yeah, I got to get up. Oh. Well, I have my watch and I have my uh, alarm clock. I need to get my phone back on board. Yeah, you do. Yeah, get three <laughs> to make sure I phone. get up every day. Stop pointing out His phone is broken the spider webs pieces. on my phone. It, <laughs> it does turn on. <laughs> And calls people. It, it does. It does call people. That's it. It'll it'll text on occasion, <laughs> uh, but that that is awesome. And so, maybe as encouragement or lessons that you would give to to those students, is there are there? And we've already covered a lot of great mm -hmm. ideas, beliefs, philosophies that you guys incorporate. Mm -hmm. But are there one or two other big ones, either personally or with the culture that you create, that you think? you know, the, the, that next generation uh, really ought to take to heart? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, two that I have instilled just in my life and have made it, you know, kind of like my life motto or my life anthem that has been infiltrated into Charleston Hope is, you know, number one, every individual matters. Um, yeah. And that is something Charleston Hope, that's what we're centered on. And that's, you know... We work in Title I schools, but, you know, we want to support and love. Yes, our mission and what Charleston Hope does is, is in Title I schools, but we, as people, we're called to love and serve everyone. It doesn't matter what background, what color, what ethnicity, any of that stuff, you right. know. And 
you know, like you serve where you can serve. And if you find a need, you see how you can meet that need. And if you can't meet it, call on some other people. We're a community. But I mean, just every individual matters. And then really with that, with trust and hope, and then myself, that that important belief of, you know, we will at Trust and Hope, our saying is like, we'll never overlook the importance of impacting one to impact many. Mm. Um, you know, if, if feeding one child, if making one kid smile, if, if helping one kid get on grade level, he may right. go and change the world. He may be the next right. president of the United the States. The compound yep. uh, effect and influence yep. that we get to have that, yeah. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. I and mean, I'm glad you said that because it's definitely something that I think students need to start under should start yeah. understanding and, there, and it's never too early to start thinking about that absolutely um especially a lot of students and young people i think they can often think they, they yeah. can't influence others but the truth is they already are yeah. the truth is we are in our mid-20s but yeah. we still remember the students or mm-hmm. leaders or teachers or whatever from from our childhood that oh, impacted absolutely. us positively and negatively yeah. whether it's a student that made fun of us yeah. or it's a student that really rallied us up maybe like a captain on that team right. or, or whatever it was right and uh or, or just a friendly face in the hallway who made yeah. his name for being just a really awesome person. Absolutely. Um, and like you think w- with you saying that, you know, I can think of, of those people that showed that kindness and, you know, in, in times where I didn't deserve it or I thought I didn't deserve it. And, you know, it's like that, what you just said, those instances, they stuck with me. They helped shape who I've become. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, just getting really, really to the point is, it's kind of like just what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of yeah. memory do you want to be in someone's mind? Do you want to be that that person? And I got to speak to eighth graders because when I was in middle school and high school, I was not a nice person. I I gossiped. I, what? You gossiped oh, and weren't yeah. a nice person in middle school? Oh. I thought you were born just an incredible person, create a nonprofit, <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, no. <laughs> Ask anybody that I grew up with and they will be like, it is a miracle you are the person you are today. They'll be like, <laughs> whoa I get it all the time and I'm kind of like okay we got it you know I was not a great kid like, <laughs> you're like stop move on you know you're like 12 years later come was, on that was 12 years ago yeah. people I've changed you know <laughs> that's but that's hilarious yeah, I think every great person they yeah. probably are a miracle story because yeah. I mean and you don't even have to necessarily like change right. I mean people in like podunk nowhere uh, another country don't know who we are but it doesn't mean right. we're not changing right the world or our communities yeah exactly and then I mean, just going back to, I mean, with that, every life matters and, and changing one, never overlooking that, you know, one thing that we is our, one of our top two along with that is, is relationships change lives. Um, mm-hmm. We believe relationship and I believe relationships, not programs or events change lives. Um, so everything that we do at Charleston Hope instills some form of face-to-face interaction. We're never going to just go drop off a box of pencils to a classroom. If you're going to drop off a box of pencils, go into the classroom, meet the kids, hang out with the teacher. Maybe you'll find a need that she has that maybe you could meet it or you know someone else could have. And so, I mean, that's just so important to me is is in everything you do, you know, just kind of looking of where can I have a relationship, you know, and and looking at it not from what can I gain from this relationship, but like what can I give from this relationship You know, a lot of times we think, I mean, just even in the leadership world and just, you know, the average daily life of a person, you know, relationships. And when you think of people who have, you know, you see all these people I see on Instagram and I'm like, oh, I wish I had their life. (laughs) Most of the time for me, when I see that they're surrounded by a bunch of people, they're surrounded by friends and family. And I'm just like, and I have that. Like, I absolutely have that. It's, um, and it's just kind of like looking of, of am I recognizing that and am I making that an important, you know, aspect of my life of that relationships, um, yeah. I, they change lives. And I like, I like recognizing is a big mm-hmm. thing because usually yeah. things are all around us or right in front of us. Yeah. But if you don't recognize it, yep. like uh, this year, uh, one of my words was opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so uh, like, mm, like as good. a theme for this year. And so with opportunity, really the key to opportunity is recognizing it. Oh, yeah. Because there's opportunities everywhere. All the time. You just got to now put on different eyes and be able to see them. Right. And, you know, I I think about students in school and they're they're literally walking by opportunities to to influence somebody. Yeah. And I I get it. I know there's fear 
Yeah. Um, or there's yeah. insecurity with, I don't have nothing to offer. You know, I can't give what I don't already have. Yeah. Um, which is another thing you just said, giving yeah. in, in a relationship yeah. um, is a thing to, to do first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> give before receive. And there'll um, always be fear, but, you know, it's kind of like what we talked about earlier about being uncomfortable. You know, it, it probably is uncomfortable for me. And one thing we talked to our students about and just, I mean, I can remember being in college of, I saw a kid sitting by himself and I felt like I should go sit and eat with him, you know? Yeah. Just to eat a 30 minute lunch with him. I mean, and I would get so fearful, be like, oh my gosh, he would think, or she would think I'm nuts. Like who is a stranger? Like blah, 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 blah. They but, rarely think that, I think. Yeah, no, they don't. <laughs> they it's like it's, it's always that. in our head. Um, yeah. It's always in our head. And you know, I would, I can remember the times I would walk away not doing it and feeling so terrible of just like, oh my gosh, like I could have missed knowing this person or I could have missed, you know, learning what someone was struggling about or even celebrating in their life yeah. to get to walk through with them or celebrate with them. And, you know, but then I can, I also just hold on to those moments where I did do it and it doesn't mean that a best friend relationship came out of it. Yeah. But when sure. I did it and walked away, I felt empowered. I felt inspired by them, by what they offered and just a lot more confident to be able to do it again the next time. And, you know, you know, I, I heard this podcast actually I was listening to the other day and it was like, don't just fake it till you make it, you know, fake it till you become it mm. in a good sense, you know, looking at that as with a good perspective of, right. it does make me nervous. I'm going to fake it. You know, I'm just going to keep going after it until it becomes a part of me until I keep that confidence. And now, you know, I got no problem walking up, but two years ago, I would stand there and say no, but now I'll just, Hey, can I sit with you? And yeah. then, you know, so that would totally change the lunchroom dynamic. Yes. If, if some people started doing that Yes. And, and I get this a challenge, but like I often think about the lunchroom is like one of the greatest examples of like uncomfortableness, all yep. clashing. Yep. And then you just <laughs> stand there and you're like, Oh my gosh, where to sit. And right. you know, it's, I, someone actually told me the other day, they were like, the lunchroom is one of the most, not just like racially, but one of the most segregated yeah, right. places in America. Like you walk into a lunchroom, that's where you see segregation. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean like may blacks not, and whites. May and, not necessarily be right. like two colors or even right. color at all. Could be you just, just got this group whatever. here, this group here, and you know, you got that kid coming in, this new kid, and they don't know where they fit in, you know? Right. It's kind of like, who's gonna get up and say, hey, sit with us? Most of the time, no one. And yeah. it's kind of like, think of the person that, that you could be in that person's life in that moment that they can talk about for the rest of their lives of, I remember when I walked in and Kyle stood up and said, hey, come sit with us, or as opposed to right. someone who didn't. Yeah, they could potentially remember you for the rest of your life. Yeah. You never, because I mean, you never yeah. know what's going on with them, yeah, especially exactly. the new student. It, oh, yeah. it makes me think of that quote slash movie scene in Coach Carter, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Where uh, the kid stands up, basically says, our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate, but we were powerful beyond measure. Yep. Um, and he goes on. Yep. <laughs> and uh, and I love that quote because I think I think it's pretty accurate. Oh, absolutely. You know, we're we're oftentimes more afraid of doing something good. Yep. Than even doing something bad. Oh, absolutely. Which absolutely. is absolutely. Which again, I get it's a challenge. It's not a new challenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, and so. it's easier said than done. You know, it's easy. It's a lot easier to easier to sit and talk about it. But sure. you know, to put it into practice and to implement it into your life. You know, that's difficult. And then even for the young adults, you know, like we've talked about getting out of college, you know, we have mm -hmm. those experiences. We enter into new worlds and yeah. we enter into new jobs and new situations where we're either the person walking in or we're either the person that's already been there. And so yeah. it's, I don't think that ever really changes <laughs> yeah. as you get older of feeling inadequate or feeling kind of out of place for a little bit, but you know, it just takes that one person to relationships change lives. Yeah. So standing up and saying, hey, come sit with us. Let's start a re conversation, uh, start a relationship. And then I think the world would change if we started doing that. Yeah. For sure. Ooh, that's good. Well, I'll probably just kind of end the meats and the potatoes at that. Yeah. Then. yeah. So uh, that is awesome <laughs> stuff. Well, then as we close, as far as shout outs slash plugs, things you want to support, where they can find Charleston Hope. Um, maybe start with shout outs. You got any, you got people you want to give shout outs to? Oh gosh. <laughs> I 
My mom and dad. <laughs> your, your mom and dad. Yeah. There you go. Absolutely. No, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, family. Yeah, my family. They have supported me. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, from a young age, instilled in me what it looks like to serve others before myself. And so I think that and that is my shout out. Yeah, absolutely. Know? Ooh, yeah. P- plugs and whatever else, wh- where people can find you, maybe if you want to be found. Yeah. Yeah, so they can you can visit Charleston Hope, read all about us. Um, CharlestonHope. CharlestonHope.com. Okay. Yeah, we're a .com. See, kind of something we well, nowadays, messed up when we were younger. but Well, nowadays you can get any, like .gov. You right. can get like a .gov, I think. Yeah. You're not even a government. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, CharlestonHope.com. You can follow us on Facebook. Um, just type in Charleston Hope. Um, I'm Emily Hoisington. You can find me on Instagram, see all that we do. That's at E. Hoisington, H-O-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-N. You'll at see. E. Hoisington. Yeah, lots about gotcha. my personal life on there. You said that's Insta? Instagram. On your gram? On my gram. My gram. Cool. Yeah. And your, is that where, you, any anything else you want to plug? Any other social media? I mean, feel free to friend request me on Facebook. I don't know. Emily whatever. Hoisington. I don't, I don't <laughs> even do Facebook, so I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, I, I, ask people to, Facebook. I ask people to plug these things, and I'm like, well, I don't. I don't even do Facebook. I know. He so doesn't do even I have know? one, guys. Slash, I don't have any of the above. I'm trying really. to get him to get an Instagram. An Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what I would do. I don't. I think you'd be great at Instagram stories. You think I'd be great at Instagram stories? Yeah. I don't know if I should take that as a compliment or not. That would be great. Like, you could be Instagram storying this. <laughs> I'll, take, just, I'll take that as a compliment. It is. You, I don't yeah. know what it necessarily <laughs> means. <laughs> I'll teach you. I'll, I'll accept you. it as a compliment. I'll teach you. <laughs> you, you could do like a how-to course for me or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's probably a 10% chance that'll happen, but yeah, that's okay. There's a maybe one day. Cool. <laughs> hey, step out of being uncomfortable. Uh, Are you uncomfortable I'll have to figure out another. An I'll have to figure out another excuse. <laughs> no. It, no, it makes it makes me too comfortable. That's why. So I have to. Oh, right. It make me more mm-hmm. comfortable. Yeah, well, yeah. cool. Well, Emily, thanks again for joining. I thought this was great. I'm excited. And uh, I guess another plug for the viewers: please support. There's a PayPal link in the show notes. We have Facebook Generation at Generation Giants. We have a Twitter. We have YouTube. Subscribe on iTunes. Did you subscribe, Emily? Not yet. I'm about to. Okay. I'm not going to post this until I'm you I'm about said. to. Oh, I will. I, I already liked the Facebook page before Sweet. we started. So Follow Emily's lead. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for you guys' support. So with Thanks that, for having me. Thank you. We were meant to live for so much more. And we lost ourselves.